we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome back to Science Under the Stars, everybody. Uh, this is our November talk with Ruben Tovar. Uh, quick reminder that we do have one more talk this semester on December 9th. Julia York will be talking to us about why birds are cooler than you. And this is also figuratively. So there's probably some temperature nonsense thrown in there. So uh, I would like to introduce Ruben this evening. Um, grew up in San Antonio. He then did his BS in inter interdisciplinary studies at UT Arlington, uh, where one of the cooler facts I learned about Ruben is he actually had a scholarship for competitive cheerleading, which I thought was really cool. He then graduated, got his master's in bio from Texas State University, where he started studying uh, eye reduction in blind salamanders. And we're going to hear a little bit more about those tonight. And he's currently at UT with us. He's in uh, the Hillis lab. He's in his fourth year, and he's actually part of a $1.2 million NSF grant to kind of study the evolution and development of these cave salamanders that reside in Texas. And so again, we'll see a little bit more uh, about these salamanders tonight. But Ruben's also broadly interested in how evolution and development play a role in shaping the diversity of organisms. He currently is looking at and trying to understand the underlying molecular and developmental mechanisms responsible for eye loss. So there's, there's a common thread tonight and other characteristics that are associated with underground living as well. So Ruben, Thanks for coming on and hope it's a great talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, everyone can hear me, right? Just to make sure here. You can hear me, right, Kyle? You're good to go. All right, man. Thanks. Um, yeah, th thanks for the introduction. And um, thank you, everybody out there for being, for being here tonight. Um, and uh, just so I don't forget, I want to thank all of the Science of the Stars uh, organizers, including Kyle and Julia and Anne and, um, and Britt that's helped me out. Um, so uh, Christina, uh, Jeff, so uh, thank y'all all for, uh, it was a team effort and um, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to speak to everybody. And so, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get started here. Um, the title of my talk uh, tonight is uh, The World Beneath Your Feet, uh, A Salamander's Perspective. And so, as Kyle mentioned, though, before I before I get too in depth here with uh, with uh, what I study and 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 uh, revealing a little bit about um, some of the uh, some of the questions that I ask, um, just want to take y'all through. Oh, excuse me. Take you through a little a little history again, really quick. So, uh, as Kyle mentioned, um, I am from San Antonio, Texas, uh, born and raised, and uh, was involved a little bit uh, in, in Boy Scouts. And uh, so this is a picture of my dad and I at Enchanted Rock, a maybe less flattering picture of myself uh, at Enchanted Rock. Um, and so it, this is a, a beautiful state park if you haven't been here before. Um, it's not too far from San Antonio. Um, and uh, this is probably one of the many um, uh, backpacking hikes that we were prepping for for another trip in Colorado. As Kyle also mentioned, uh, I did uh, participate in some uh, extracurricular activities when I was an undergrad. Um, I did receive a scholarship for it, and um, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. So yes, I am a or was. I don't think I don't think I can do some of the same things I used to be able to do, but competitive cheerleading. Um, while I was an undergrad, um, uh, I also entertained the idea of becoming a, an anthropologist and in particular uh, studying archaeology. Um, and so here's a picture of uh, me. Um, I am here um, digging at, in, in Belize at a Mesoamerican site. Uh, and, and I found that although here I am taking notes, I would often be um, chasing snakes and, and frogs. So uh, it, it became apparent to me that, uh, that maybe my passion wasn't archaeology, uh, but I was happy that I had explored it nonetheless. And so um, this leads me to, to where I am now. I'm, I'm a scientist and I study biology. And so you might, uh, you might um, think of the maybe quintessential picture of a of a scientist in a lab. Um, here's one, uh, an example of me looking, or I mean, I do look through microscopes, don't get me wrong, but this is obviously slightly staged. So this is maybe what people are, are often used to. Uh, the program that, uh, that I'm 
in right now, or rather the, the department that I'm in right now is called the uh, integrative uh, Department of Integrative Biology. And so why I think that's important to mention is because Yes, there are uh, a lot of uh, a lot of times that I do find myself in front of a microscope or a dissection scope, but there also are a lot of times that I find myself um, out in the field, and uh, and um, we'll we'll think a little bit more about that here uh, momentarily. Um, so so yeah, that's uh, integrative biology, and I'm specifically. Uh, interested in how ecology, evolution, and behavior all play a role in, in the variation and the diversity of organisms that we see uh, all around us. Um, I would also say that integrative biology also offers um, wonderful opportunities for collaborations um, beyond just the department or the university. So uh, just a couple of weeks ago, in fact, we had um, uh, three um, wonderful students from uh, um, Mexico, uh, from the University of Mexico City, um, from UNAM, come to visit and they uh, helped me out uh, collecting a number of salamanders that I needed for my dissertation. And so here is a picture of the lab and, uh, and also the, uh, some of the collaborators uh, from from Mexico. And I hope y'all made it back well, guys. And uh, hopefully y'all are, maybe y'all are around uh, out in Zoom land. But hello again. And thank you again. All right. So I mentioned biology. Uh, biology. So, so what is biology exactly? Just to kind of give a quick overview. Well, biology is quite simply the study of life, right? And I would argue that uh, life is all around you, right? Um, you, of course, could go out uh, into a park or you could uh, go camping or hiking and see life. But um, I also, some of y'all might even have uh, living things that you keep as pets. Like uh, here are two examples at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. These are uh, our dogs, Rhody and Prim. Um, and so so biology is just quite simply the study of life. And so then what do I study as a biologist? Well, I study salamanders. Um, I guess that might have been obvious by now. Um, and, uh, and so what exactly is a salamander? Let's take a moment just to kind of think about this for a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up a, uh, a couple of potential answers, and I want you to consider them, what you think a salamander might be. Um, just so that we are all on the same page. Okay, so here are your options. What is a salamander? Is um, a salamander A, a reptile? B, a fish? C, an amphibian? Or D, a lizard? So take a second just to consider these. All right, everybody maybe have a guess or uh, relatively, uh, you know, some, something uh, relatively good guess. If you do, keep it in mind. Um, so right off the bat, I'll say that uh, salamanders um, are not reptiles, and by extension, they are not lizards. So that's a no-go there. Um, if you are interested in reptiles uh, and, and lizards in particular, or reptiles in general, I would also suggest that you might check out uh, a couple of my lab mates' previous Science Under the Stars talks. Uh, Britt White just recently spoke about leg and leglessness. Uh, the story of lizard evolution, um, and uh, and Thomas Marshall uh, relatively recently spoke a little bit about some of the snakes that we find here in Central Texas, which are also reptiles. All right, well, salamanders are also not fish, so that leaves only one uh, answer, and that is amphibians, right? So salamanders are amphibians. All right, maybe maybe some of us knew that. Uh, we're just working through this here, so so bear bear with me. So amphibian, what makes an amphibian different from other animals? Well, uh, let's consider some amphibians. Uh, we know that frogs are amphibians, newts are amphibians, toads, and now we know that salamanders are right. 
Well, one, uh, one thing that all amphibians share is that they have this very specialized skin that allows them to breathe and drink through it, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Not, I mean, there aren't any other animals that do that, right? Um, so that's really fascinating. Um, the second is that most amphibians have two life stages, one that's a larval state and then another that's an adult. So in the larval state, uh, most amphibians are aquatic. And so you could see how maybe some people might have thought that the answer to the previous question uh, might have been fish, because in fact, amphibians do spend some of their life in the water. Um, so that's OK. Um, you'll also notice that uh, salamanders and newts, at least, um, have four limbs and they have tails. So they look a lot like lizards, which are reptiles. So I could also see how people might have confused salamanders with reptiles and in particular lizards, right? Um, and lastly, given both of these two things, uh, amphibians heavily rely on fresh and healthy water. Um, so that is uh, something that's very important for an amphibian to, um, to live and to continue to, um, to uh, reproduce. Okay, so let's, uh, let's draw our attention here to Texas. So m there might be some people out there that are not exactly from Texas and may think about Texas uh, in, this, in this light, right? So kind of this relatively flat, arid uh, region. Um, and in this picture, there's actually not an amphibian. There's another reptile uh, that's pretty famous uh, from Texas here. And this is a Texas horn lizard. Um, so this was out in West Texas that I took this picture. But I want, to, I want to introduce to everybody the fact that Texas is actually has a lot of aquifers. And so what, what is an aquifer? Well, an aquifer is quite simply an underground body of water. And so uh, here in Texas, we have both the Edwards and the Trinity Aquifer, and uh, they're important. They're also outlined, let me see if I can get my curse, cursor here. They're also outlined here by this, black, um, by this black outline here in Central Texas. And so the aquifers uh, provide a number of other uh, aquatic habitats, which is pretty neat. So they, they uh, some aquatic habitats include um, springs, like, uh, like are found here at Honey Creek State Natural Area. This is a spring. Um, they also, they also uh, provide aquatic habitats by way of uh, caves and deep aquifers. Um, here is an example of a cave called Preserve Cave. This is also at uh, Honey Creek State Natural Area. Okay, so, um, it turns out that uh, we have, in fact, a number of these uh, um, aquatic habitats uh, exemplified throughout this whole range here in Central Texas. Um, and so here is Austin uh, and an example of a spring in Austin. Um, here is San Marcos um, and a spring, uh, an example of a spring in San Marcos, San Antonio and Del Rio. And so uh, there are major springs that lie all through this region um, of the uh, Edwards Aquifer, and in particular, um, the Edwards Plateau. And so it's, it makes sense that, in fact, some of the major cities here in central Texas uh, were founded by these fresh body of water uh, waters because people rely also on fresh water. So it makes sense that we have these relatively large cities that are right next to uh, relatively reliable uh, bodies of water, of fresh water, that is. Okay, well, there are organisms, other organisms that rely on this fresh body of water, right? And, um, excuse me, try to move this. Um, and so I'd like to think a little bit more about the uh, diversity of the Texas groundwater salamanders that we find in these aquatic habitats um, that are supported by the Edwards Aquifer and Trinity Aquifer. And so this, this group of salamanders is called Eurecia, um, and they're from 
uh, as I mentioned here in Central Texas, and they never leave the water. So, uh, so what's fascinating about this uh, group of salamanders is that they are so diverse. And so here is an example of the uh, diversity that we find just yards from each other at the entrance of a cave. Um, and so it turns out that salamanders that occupy the aquatic habitats um, that uh, live, that are uh, underground, um, often have these, um, these characteristics associated with them, like uh, relatively little pigment and, and reduced eyes. And then those salamanders that live in the aquatic habitats that are above ground, like springs and, and streams, uh, have relatively well-developed eyes and pigmentation. And so here are just a handful of different species that we find uh, here in Central Texas and, uh, and hopefully uh, exemplify the amount of diversity that we have by way of these uh, absolutely fascinating groundwater salamanders here in Central Texas. Um, and so since, since some of these salamanders occupy, occupy these deeper portions of, um, of, the, uh, of the aquifer, it's, it's relatively hard to get to them or to even see them. So sometimes you just have to be uh, at the right place and at the right time pretty much to even uh, observe these salamanders. So let me give you an example here. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a, an ephemeral spring or a spring that only happens uh, every once in a while when it rains enough so that the water level comes up enough that it becomes a spring. This spring, uh, Sesum Creek Spring, is in San Marcos, Texas, and uh, it's right on the, uh, the border or right on the property of Texas State University. And uh, while I was a master's student here, um, I would frequently, frequently walk by this spring, um, and when it was running, I would just kind of give it a look just to see if, the, if I saw anything. And so I'd like to give you all the opportunity to do the same. So um, here is a spring, it's, it's running, and, um, and somewhere in here, I'll just tell you that there is a salamander. Um, so why don't we take a moment, and uh, why don't you try to find the salamander in this spring? All right. Here comes the answer. So there it is, right there, nudged in the corner on the right hand side, um, is a not only a salamander. It's a Texas blind salamander, which is uh, an endangered species of salamander here in Central Texas. Um, so. So again, very much, uh, I was kind of at the right place at the right time, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to observe this individual. Another thing I'll point out is that the spring, uh, the water from the spring um, quickly flows over into this covert here underneath a bridge or underneath a road and, uh, and then goes into a stream um, that has a number of sunfish and other fishes that would quickly uh, you know, quickly uh, have a meal of this individual. So, uh, you know, there's really only a certain amount of time that sometimes these individuals will stick around places like this. And so uh, I would encourage everybody to keep your eyes open whenever things like this are happening. It turns out that I, I was able to, um, what's really cool is I was able to publish this as a small note um, uh, describing simply my observation, because that's how rare we see these individuals. All right, so we're thinking about uh, some of the deeper portions of the aquifer. Um, so this kind of leads us, we're gonna go ahead and dive into that, into, into that spring and go a little bit deeper. Um, and now we find ourselves into this kind of, into this in, in, in caves and deep aquifers. And so um, I'd like for us to just take a moment to consider now, coming, coming from the surface, now going underground, 
what kinds of things change when you do that? Um, and so when we consider the habitat um, of cave and deep caves and deep aquifers, think about some things that come to mind. And I'll, I'll, I'll point out a couple here. So one is that there actually are very uh, limited amounts of food resources uh, in, in some of these deeper portions um, of the aquifer, because just like we can't uh, get down there very easily, other organisms can't get down there very easily. And so it really, it really uh, is uh, just a handful of organisms that pretty much come up to the surface and then take, take uh, well, they go, they retreat back down into caves and, uh, and that's pretty much the food resource for uh, anything that is um, in the cave permanently. So what else is what else is uh, is different in a cave than uh, say a spring? Well, there are also relatively constant conditions. Uh, so um, you, you can imagine that being underground, you're relatively well. Um, uh, 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 you're not exposed to the the rest of the environment, so things tend to be constant, even by way of water quality too. So the temperature is constant um, and all of the water uh, um, uh, quality is, is constant. So, um, so in a cave, it's little food re resources, uh, very con uh, relatively constant environment um, by way of temperature and other, other things. Um, so what, there's one more thing I'm missing here that should be a, should be a, a no brainer, right? Y'all probably already have thought of it. So I'm gonna just shout it out loud here. No sunlight, right? Um, I mean, sun is, is the source of energy um, for, for pretty much everything, for everything, right? So, I mean, it's that source of energy that is transferred from things that come out of the cave and then go back into the cave, that's still the same energy that's, that's being transferred, right? Um, so there's no sunlight here in, in, these, in these caves and in deep portions of the aquifer. So what does this mean uh, when you are living uh, for millions of years in these conditions? Um, it, essentially, you are now uh, becoming accustomed and maybe even starting to adapt to living in perpetual darkness, right? So here's our friend again the Texas blind salamander. Um, and I'd like to think a little bit about um, how it looks different from that other spring salamander and what, um, what kind of things might uh, change in its body or, uh, or even in its sensory uh, capabilities that might lend themselves um, a little bit more to, uh, to living in perpetual darkness. So let's, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to split um, what I'm thinking about here into two major categories. Um, and so let's consider things that might be uh, increased and uh, things that might be reduced. So characteristics that might be increased, characteristics that might be reduced. And they can be anything from what it looks like, what its body type is, uh, to even other, uh, to, to even sensory um, uh, sensory uh, uh, um, capabilities. So if you think back a little bit and think about um, what are your senses, how do you use them, and what would make sense to uh, either increase if you're in complete darkness or reduce if you're in complete darkness. So let's just take a moment to think about, think about those things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the increased first. So if you want to focus on, on those things, let's, let's do that. All right. So do people have some ideas about uh, what kind of characteristics might be increased in a salamander that lives in and has adapted to perpetual darkness? All right, here's what I've got. 
So they've got relatively broad heads. Maybe the sense of smell is also increased. The sense of touch uh, might also be increased. And they seem to have these like these really elongated kind of spindly limbs, um, which isn't what we saw with, uh, with that, those spring salamanders. Okay, great. So, um, so that's, that's what I had. Uh, it's, it's, of course, not an exhaustive list. So, uh, so I, I'd be looking forward to, to hear what other people had, uh, had thought of. But now let's think about some things, uh, some characteristics that might be reduced. Okay, so um, we've, we've thought about those things that might be heightened. So reduced. Well, they certainly have seem to have a reduction of color. Um, when you live in a place that uh, has relatively uh, little food resources, your digestion might slow down a little bit, maybe, right? Uh, and what about the sense of time? Time might be uh, might also be altered slightly. Uh, if if you are not subjected to the day to day cycle of the of the sun coming up and you you being exposed to light. Uh, sun going down and and now you know it's time to go to bed or maybe your body knows it's time to go to bed well if these guys don't have that uh, then maybe their sense of time is a little bit different than what you might expect for something that it lives on the surface right but perhaps one of the most important uh, uh, sensory and uh, organs that we're going to be considering tonight uh, falls in this reduction uh, um, category, and that those are eyes, right? So um, you can kind of see them. They're relative. They're these kind of these little black pigmented dots right here, and those are the eyes uh, of the Texas blind salamander. I'll also say that uh, those little black pigmented dots are are completely covered over by skin, um, and so they're almost sunk into the head a little bit, which is fascinating. And so I am interested in understanding how these eyes don't develop in a salamander that would have otherwise developed eyes. And so to do this, um, I, need to, uh, I need to receive or I'd rather produce some of these developmental stages so I can track eye development um, th uh, or I can track the eye through development. Um, in these salamanders? Well, in order to receive embryos, I need to breed the salamanders, right? And so uh, on the left-hand side here, this is a female, um, a female blind salamander that's laid an egg here and is laying an egg here um, on her little, on a little screen um, that is provided in their cage. And on the right here is that developmental series that, um, that I was able to um, obtain once I was able to breed these salamanders. Well, that's all, that sounds like a game plan, right? I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, well, well, not so much, right? Because I have to go and find these salamanders. And we just spoke about how difficult it is to, um, to, uh, to go and find these salamanders and to obtain them because they're in places that we just can't, or are extremely hard to reach, right? So uh, I would like to take everybody um, with me here on a short uh, caving expedition uh, to go find some of these blind salamanders. Um, so uh, so I, I can't uh, pick up all, all 30 plus of y'all to, to come with me. So I'll have to do this virtually here. So let's go caving. All right, so I'm gonna show you a video here. The first one, is uh, is a video of us trekking through uh, a cave. All right. So here we are. Uh, I, along with a, a buddy, are in the cave, and this is what a typical cave might look like when we're looking for salamanders. There's, of course, there's water, some stalactites going on, um, and we are trudging trudging through the water here, and. Um, keeping our eye out in the water for salamanders. Um, and what oftentimes uh, they'll be kind of on the side, um, uh, sometimes on the wall, they, 
they're in the water though. They will be in the water. Um, this is me wiping my camera, uh, my GoPro, so that you can see it. Um, sometimes a cave and water come pretty close together. So uh, there's a lot of ducking um, uh, and some head turning uh, so that you can continue to breathe, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, yeah, definitely not a place for claustrophobic people. Um, here, here's my uh, partner here. And whenever we go into caves, whenever anybody goes into caves, uh, you always bring a partner with you um, and then always leave someone at the entrance of the cave. Um, that's just a uh, safety precaution that we always do. Um, and so this is what a typical cave might look like when we're looking for salamanders. Um, and we're just kind of keeping our eyes open, very muddy usually. Um, and uh, you can kind of see some bugs flying around here uh, through my light. Um, some of those bugs also offer some amount of energy for the cave and creatures that live in them. Um, all right, so there's a little bit of walking through a cave. Now let's see if uh, we can't uh, catch a salamander here. All right, so keep your eyes open, guys. They're not super obvious, um, so we'll we'll see if we can we'll see if you can you can spot it as we as we go through this next video here. Okay, there's a salamander I see already. I'm positioning my net. I have a, re a relatively large net on the right. I have a smaller elongated net on the left and I'm gonna chase it into this large net. Did y'all see it? Let me replay that. All right, large net on the right. The blue long net will come over to the left and I'm gonna try to coax it into this large net. So one more time, and I'm gonna point it out for you here. So the salamander is right here. If I quit moving, it's right here. And it's gonna scurry right into that net. And there it is. So I've caught a salamander. Yay. I can graduate, maybe. <laughs> So there it is, this large white salamander, a, a cave salamander uh, in my net. And uh, pretty, I, I get goosebumps just even like reliving this thing. So it's pretty fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to do this and, uh, and, and to, uh, to find these absolutely fascinating species. So I'm gonna do my best to gently kind of put it into the, Nalgene bottle there, and uh, that's where we hold them in, so that they um, um, they remain, you know, in a in a structured, hard structured plastic bottle, so that uh, if we bump into a, a rock or something, we don't um, we don't uh, it doesn't break, and the salamander doesn't get away. Okay, so you've accompanied me uh, on that uh, caving adventure. Thanks a lot for your help. Uh, now we're back to, uh, to square one again, right? Which is, let's try to breed these salamanders so we can get development, so we can think about this eye reduction already. All right, so let's uh, assume we've got some breeding salamanders and some, uh, some embryos now. So when we, uh, when we think about you know, how an eye might develop, um, and in particular, how maybe eyes at some point in something that's blind versus something that is sighted uh, might diverge uh, through development. I think a little bit about this kind of relatively simple, um, simple schematic here. So here are uh, two examples. One, uh, the top is a surface salamander that clearly has eyes. Uh, the bottom is our friend, the Texas blind salamander that does not or has reduced eyes. Um, and I would imagine that there is uh, some amount of commonality between these two during early development, right, uh, of an eye uh, developing. So here uh, in green is what I would call an optic cup, and then in pink would be the lens. And so there would be, you know, an optic cup and a lens uh, that would start to develop 
even in something that is blind, like the Texas blind salamander. But what I would predict is that at some point they would start to diverge, right? At some point, maybe things start kind of going differently when it comes to the uh, Texas blind salamander. And then eventually would lead to this kind of reduced eye versus the developed eye that we see in the surface salamanders. Okay, well, to think about this, uh, I used uh, a technique called um, uh, micro CT scanning. And so in micro CT scanning, um, we are able to CT scan a salamander so that we can also identify, uh, well, we can identify bones, um, but what we do differently and this uh, type of CT scanning is that we use iodine and we stain soft tissue. Um, so when we do this, uh, it allows us to uh, be able to, to observe, let's see, it's gonna play again here. Allow us to observe the soft tissue. Sorry guys. Um, so what we're seeing is all the bright, all the bright spots that you see are, uh, are relatively dense tissue. So here's a, Here's the cranium. Um, this is actually the lens, which is a soft tissue, but it, it's, it's a weird soft tissue in that it absorbs a lot of iodine. Um, here is the lower, uh, the jaw and some teeth um, and all the musculature all around this, we usually wouldn't be able to see, but in this, in this scenario, we can, we can see it. So it's pretty, a pretty fascinating technique. Okay, so once we have the CT scan, uh, we can then use software to pull these scans together um, and, uh, and make a three-dimensional um, uh, uh, three, three uh, model of what we're seeing by way of the scan. Um, and so uh, that is, that's very useful. Um, and we can also cut through this three-dimensional model to see all of that soft tissue that we had observed before, um, now rendered in 3D, which is uh, incredibly useful, right? Especially when we're thinking about how an eye is developing or not developing. Um, we can then go through with this software and color in regions of uh, the anatomy, like say the optic cup here and the lens uh, that we're interested in. And so then this results in something uh, that uh, looks something like this. So then we can pull all of our, our highlighted, uh, highlighted regions of anatomy uh, of interest and uh, pull it together to get a full uh, comprehensive picture, uh, a 3D picture of what is happening by way of eye development uh, in these salamanders, um, which is awesome. Okay, so here I have four salamanders and they're four micro CT scans. Now I've already uh, uh, 3D rendered them so you can tell uh, that's, that's already done. Um, my question to y'all is where are the eyes here? So we're gonna start there. So take a moment to check out these four different species of salamanders, uh, embryos. And, uh, and try to identify where the eye is here um, and, and point to the eye. All right, people have an idea? So here are the eyes, great. Now, here are the adult uh, forms, I guess, the adult stages of each of these species. Um, so now what I want you to do is take a moment to try and match what you think uh, each of these adults uh, go to. So which, which embryo do you think represents each one of these adult salamanders? And so I'll tell you this, as you're thinking about it, we, we have, uh, uh, our old friend here, the Texas blind salamander. This is the Barton spring salamander. It has eyes. Uh, this is the um, Cascade cavern salamander. 
uh, from Honey Creek Cave. It has reduced eyes, so it is from a cave. So it's a what we would consider a blind salamander or what some may consider blind salamander. Here is a, a San Marcos salamander, which also has seemingly well-developed eyes. So which one of these goes to which embryo? All right. So here is the uh, San Marcos salamander. Here is the Texas blind salamander. Here is the Barton Springs salamander. And finally, the uh, Honey Creek Cave salamander. So this is pretty, pretty cool. It might surprise you to know that the uh, two cave salamanders um, have what seem to be developing eyes at this stage. Um, so yeah, you can also ask yourself this question. How well did you match the salamanders with, the, with, the, with its eyes? Um, so now that we know this, uh, and given what, what I'm uh, able to do with the uh, software, I am now going to go through and uh, render what we've identified as an optic cup in green and the lens in pink. So here is the optic cup and lens for the um, uh, San Marcos salamander and the Barton Springs salamander and the optic cup and lens in the Texas blind salamander and the Honey Creek cave salamander. So it might surprise you to know that the Texas blind salamander uh, in particular has some amount of lens and optic cup development going on, which is pretty fascinating. So this, this, take a, this takes us back to this idea of when, when is there different eye development between these two phena, between these two types of salamanders, right? And so you'll remember that uh, we started with uh, a common place between the two, and uh, then we hypothesize, right? We think, or I think, that there's at some point going to be differences in development of the eye, which eventually lead to pretty drastic differences in the adult eye. So what appears to have happened is that we have found this common place uh, between these two drastically different uh, salamanders uh, by way of eye, uh, adult eye development. Um, so they seem to both have what appears to be an optic cup and they seem to both have what appears to be some amount of a lens developing. And so if that seemed at all interesting to you, uh, then I would say, uh, or rather suggest that maybe, uh, you know, stick around and hopefully I, you know, get another chance to speak uh, in the future at Science Under the Stars where, uh, so I'm excited to say that I have other data I haven't gone completely through yet, right? Um, and, uh, and um, I have, you know, starting to fill in the gaps uh, of development, um, that leads to an underdeveloped eye or reduced eye in the blind salamanders um, and a fully developed eye in the adult uh, surface salamanders. So I'm excited. So what have we learned today? Well, salamanders, uh, they're amphibians. They heavily depend on the same fresh water that we all depend on, right? Um, the Central Texas salamanders are quite diverse. Uh, cave salamanders have these reduced eyes. Spring salamanders have what seem to be developed eyes. Um, caves are hard to squeeze into. Um, and so this makes it difficult um, to, to study these salamanders, um, some of the species anyways. Um, so it also makes it difficult to get our hands on them, right? To do developmental studies like this. And finally, we know that both the cave and the spring salamanders develop some amount of uh, of an eye, like the lens and the optic cup. And finally, there's still a lot more to be discovered. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about, uh, about 
um, going through more of this uh, CT, micro CT data and also including uh, more examples of, uh, of cave salamanders in my data set. So with that, I'd like to thank um, all of these people. So the Hillis Lab, um, NSF Funding, um, the Garcia Lab, um, the uh, NSF Undergrad Summer Research Fellows that helped out collect some of this data over this past summer. Um, and, uh, and also a lot, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these specimens that you saw today, tonight, um, by way of embryos came from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, San Marcos Aquatic Resource Center, as well as Uvalde. So there is a list of people here uh, that um, are, are um, all helping to make this project um, what it is. So I, uh, I owe a lot to uh, SMARC and Uvalde and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for the samples that we have so far. So thank you guys. Thank everybody. Um, and of course, Thank you uh, to uh, Science Under the Stars for allowing me to give this talk. Uh, and with that, I will take some questions. Excellent, Ruben. Excellent. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. I particularly enjoyed the footage in the cave. It, it never really can grasp how claustrophobic caves can be until you, you're actually in one, which is very cool. Very cool. Um, there was one question that I'll start off with. Um, that was kind of lost in the chat and it had to do with uh, like a decreased sense of time. So is this altered sense of time affect their mating cycle or do they even have these mating cycles? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, right, yeah. So, <laughs> so the answer, the simple answer is that we don't know. Um, and uh, the uh, guess is that yes, it does. Um, so, so, Right. So they don't. So, so you think of um, so what kind of what kinds of what kinds of environmental cues are there uh, that animals um, uh, that animals uh, really kind of think or uh, um, take in to to determine whether it's it's a it's a good time to mate or not mate or have babies or not have babies. Um, certainly. Uh, so the day to day cycle of. Uh, of light coming up and down is called circadian rhythm. Um, and so that certainly plays a role. Um, I would also say that the other components of being in a cave, like little food resources, also plays a role, right? You're gonna need, um, you're gonna need um, resources by way of uh, you know, allocating um, body energy to creating eggs or, um, or to put forth towards your reproductive organs, right? So, um, so there could be a number of limiting factors. I would certainly say, I would certainly think that um, the sense of time is something that plays a role in it. I would also say that uh, the amount of resources by way of food probably play a role in it as well. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Like do we, we, we think of time passing as a means to make a decision, but we always forget that these environmental determinants like resource availability and temperature that really do help animals um, focus in on when they should and shouldn't be mating. That's awesome. All right, we got two young in questions. The first one is from Alexa, who's nine. She wants to know what your favorite salamander is. Oh, no, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I have one. Um, <laughs> Top favorite... three. Okay, um, it's it's by it's a little I'm a little bit uh, biased because I you know worked with them so much, but uh, I would say the Texas blind salamander is is just was the salamander that uh, when I um, when I saw it was just completely in awe. It, it looks like a it looks like an underground alien, right? And so that's my son. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that the Texas blind salamander, uh, is certainly up there. Um, the, uh, the population at, uh, the cave that I took y'all through, uh, called preserve cave is, is fascinating because the amount of, um, variation that's in that cave. So we get a lot of different types of eye reduction there. So, um, so that is called, uh, the, that is part of the Cascade Caverns salamander is what they're called. 
Um, and so they are also fascinating. I guess those would be my kind of, oh gosh, the Barton Spring Salamanders, it, you can't, you can't deny that one either. So that was pretty cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's such a, there's such an incredible story behind them too. So uh, I guess if I had to name three, those would be the three. <laughs> nice. That's good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now Paxton, who's in kindergarten and seems like he's going to be a future herpetologist, big nice. fan of salamanders. Um, he wants to know how fast these blind salamanders are. I'm assuming land versus water as well. And then how they held up during the, the big freeze this, this winter or January. Right. Right. Uh, this, well, you, you know, I hope you, I hope you were able to get a, a quick glimpse of how quickly they move in the water. Uh, when I was netting that one individual, they are very fast in the water um, and they know how to get away. Um, that's kind of, you know, that's their part of their part of their deal, right? Um, is to potentially have to get away from predators like crayfish and things like that, right? So um, they know where to go uh, to hide. So um, they move fast in the water. Um, these salamanders here don't leave the water, but salamanders that do leave the water um range and how quickly they can get away from you some some are kind of slow um and and they're they're kind of heavy bodied and so they're they're a little bit slow um some live by uh by streams and so if you turn over a rock and there's a salamander that's a stream salamander uh meaning that it's on the land but what will happen is they will dart into the water and uh swim away and they're very quick at doing that um, so I would say that salamanders are fast, uh, and, uh, the salamanders that, um, that are, uh, that were here in, in central Texas when the freeze came over, uh, they, they did, they did fine. They're, I, I think they're, they're going to be okay. Um, and the reason is partly because of some of the things that we spoke about, right? So remember uh, that the temperature in the water uh, in the aquifer is, is relatively constant, and it's usually at a constant about 70 degrees Fahrenheit or so, 69, 70. Um, and so if it came down to it, salamanders could kind of retreat a little deeper into the aquifer and, uh, and stay warm. Um, and the opposite is kind of true as well, right? When it's really dry or we have droughts um, and the water level uh, goes down, the salamanders have no, really no choice other than to follow that water down. Um, but uh, that helps them to survive. Um, and and that's, that's why they so heavily rely on this kind of constant uh, body of water that is the Edwards and Trinity Aquifer. Yeah, those nice constant temperatures must be nice and reliable. So Alexa's back. She would like to know the smallest and biggest salamanders. Smallest and biggest salamanders. Yeah, and if you could give us some some size in there as well, rather than just two names. <laughs> oh gosh, how big is the biggest salamander? Um, I'm trying to think of uh, three meters. I don't want to lie here. Um, so I know. So the um, there are salamanders from Asia um, that are very large. Um, the Chinese giant salamander and the Japanese giant salamanders are the largest salamanders. Um, and you're looking for a number. Uh, oh, gosh, I think they get about um, five feet. Uh, five feet or so, <laughs> I think. Um, and then the smallest ones are, uh, I believe they are going to be in a tropics and they're extremely, they're like, um, oh geez, I don't, I don't even think I know its common name. Um, but they, they're, they get about, I think they're about, um, I don't know about maybe the max, a, uh, a little over an inch, inch and a half or something like that. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's very tiny. That's they're very small. tiny. Yeah. All right, so um, in these caves, they're radically low light levels, and we see that there's like a lack of pigmentation organisms that are kind of growing up in these types of environments. Uh, so why does the Texas blind salamander appear blue? Why does it appear blue? Um, I, I think that's just, I, I, that's 
probably a, a lighting uh, a photography uh, a thing. Um, so it look what might be what might be contributing to that kind of blue sheen uh, is that they although they lack uh, what we as mainly associate as uh, some of the dark pigments, I guess, to be specific, right? So they tend to lack melanin. Um, and, uh, and, but that's not to say that they don't have other kinds of pigments. Um, and so those other kinds of pigments like xanthophores and iridophores um, are still tend to hang around uh, some of these cave salamanders. And so uh, sometimes you get that sheen from, from those other pigments um, and that sheen, that kind of sheen sometimes comes off as a, as a blue tint depending on, you know, what, what the camera setting and things like that. Okay. Could just be a figment of our, our imaginations almost. The, the blue, uh, the blue embryo that I had at, at the very beginning of the talk, that was because uh, it had been, um, it had been developing in with a little bit of methylene blue in, in the water. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes that, sense. <laughs> yeah. Any of the salamanders we talked about tonight or in general considered to be endangered or at risk due to environmental contamination? Right. So, yes, uh, the Texas blind salamanders is endangered. Um, the Barton Spring salamander is endangered. Uh, so there are a number of salamanders that are endangered. I think there, and then a number that are threatened as well. Uh, there are about 14. Uh, um, 14 to 15 species of salamander uh, here in Central Texas. And, um, and I would say that, yeah, that, that one, one issue is uh, potential contamination into the, into the water. Uh, and, but uh, another kind of large, larger issue too uh, is that there's so much development happening um, here in Central Texas uh, and, and we are fortunate um, and sometimes uh, forgetful how fortunate we are to have this you know, uh, reliable body of water um, for our consumption that we need as well, um, that, uh, you know, that overdevelopment is, is also a, a major um, concern for these salamanders. More people move here, uh, more houses are built, and more... Um, more water will continue to be, you know, consumed by by us. Um, so we try to, you know, we we want to try to do everything we can to conserve water, um, and uh, and of course, you know, uh, absolutely think about not, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to contaminate water. Don't dump things into, you know, into a water uh, system or um, uh, and uh, so so all of those things as well. But but yeah, that's. That's a, that is a, uh, something that a bridge that we're going to have to, you know, cross and think about, um, as this area continues to develop. So. So let me remind everybody, feel free to type your questions into the chat and Ruben, you may have answered this somewhere in your talk and I apologize if it, if that is the case, but how many caves in or around the Austin area can you find these salamanders in? Oh gosh caves um in the austin area or essentially how many caves do you go to when you go to search for these and do all of them have these blind salamanders right okay so i have excuse me um i'm i'm counting in my head i've never mm -hmm. had to do that uh i somewhere around like maybe seven or so caves um, and, and this was all, this was all, you know, uh, this was all slightly strategic in that I, there had been, I kind of knew that there might be salamanders or there had been reported that there were salamanders or they had been collected there before. So, um, uh, there are, um, every now and again, there's like, a uh, someone that says, oh, I have a cave, you know, you want to come, come look type of thing. Um, but for the most part, my caving is uh, strategic in that I know that there have been they have been collected there before, so it's a little bit, little bit biased in that way, I guess. Um, I uh, so so 
so yeah, there, there's, there's a handful about seven or so. Yeah. Oh, cool. So they are pretty common, which is, I guess what I was, I guess I was really asking. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. If you have information, you know, they're in those caves, there's no sense in trying to find new caves if you have a reliable population or places to go. Right. Yep. Ooh, apparently there's only one cave in Austin proper that reaches the aquifer where you can get urea. Do you know what urea is? Is that a type of salamander as well? Are you asking me? I am because I don't know. I'm reading what was posted it was type, but I don't know enough about it. Oh, I see. Yes, urea. Yes. Okay. That cool. Is, that is. Yep. Yep. Very nice. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Ruben, thanks a lot for coming on. I thank you for coming back a week late after a bunch of nonsense last week happened, but we <laughs> got over it. So uh, again, excellent talk, Ruben. I'd like to remind everybody that in December, we will have Julia York back on with us. She's one of our SUTS leaders, which is pretty cool. And she's going to be talking about temperature regulation in birds. So everybody have a nice night. Have a good Thanksgiving and we'll see y'all next month. Bye-bye.